We're live. Once again, we're on different sides today. Yeah, we got to mix it up for the people. We got to mix it up. People might think I'm you. Just to be sure about that. Hello, my name is Steve Jaguer. And I'm Mike Foster. And welcome to this episode of... There we go. It worked. It worked. Um, Michael, kick off while I bring up our, uh, let's call it, show sheet for today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, we got a bunch going on today. And we actually, I guess, I think we're having some issues with Twitch, so, but we'll hold on. Um, yeah, we have a bunch today for you, so, you know, if you like what you're, what you're seeing, you know, subscribe, follow on Twitch. We also post these on YouTube, and we just had a meetup yesterday, by the way. So uh, Jessica Cherry came and talked about chaos engineering. You can find that in the Twitch Coop native security channel as well. And we look forward to, to bringing more of that to you guys. Basically every month there will be a meetup. So if you're part of the meetups, you can check that out. If you like what we do, there's other content there too. Oh uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you and throw us some of your suggestions so we can, you know, go what the heck at it. Yeah, what the heck? What the heck? I, yeah. So. That uh, that translates pretty well because we had a medium, a medium. We didn't have a seance. We had a meetup last night. It is worth mentioning that because we're in lockdown and all these meetups, meetup is meetups is funny, right? It's designed to have a location. So if you go searching for Kubernetes security, you may not find our meetup. So what we're doing is we're trying to create that meetup in other cities so that if you are in London, say for example, like I am and you search for Kubernetes security, you get to see the content that we are we are releasing. But if you don't, as Michael has just said, we do put it on YouTube and- And Twitch. And Twitch, after the fact. Mm -hmm. So um, are we gonna suffer from the same problem that we had with our no, Twitch stuff going away after 14 days? No. It is, it is up there. It will stay up there on Twitch. I have highlighted it as well, and it will be on YouTube. Uh, the whole meetup's on YouTube as well. So uh, if you, it's, it's an hour long. If you want to skip through, get to the certain parts, you know, we have, we do general updates. Jessica Cherry did chaos engineering yesterday. And then I went into the CKS a little bit. So that transitioned us nicely into uh, our general news first subject. Yeah. Yeah. The general Michael news. has passed the CKS. What was your yeah. score? Oh, I limped, <laughs> I limped over the edge. Uh, let's just say that I limped <laughs> over. Um, it was it was out of the other certifications. I found it the hardest. Uh, I found they they really did a good job because I can't give away too much. And if you want more information, go check out the meetup. But uh, they did a good job at showing whole ecosystem security because Kubernetes security is not solely in Kubernetes, right? We're talking you have to manage Docker files, you have to manage CI/CD pipelines, you have to manage your registries. You know, you have to implement admission controllers, audit policies, logs, and things like that. So. I thought they did a really good job at whole ecosystem. There's a couple tools that I was unfamiliar with that I actually got to learn and get more hands on with during the study process. So I think they did a really good job. And I think the fact that it is harder is actually more useful because I, I, for, for a performance based exam, I think that getting it's, it's not just enough to know the documentation and bookmark things. You really have to get hands on with a lot of these examples. So totally. Yeah, and it was interesting some of the after meetup chat in the Kubernetes launch that we had because there was someone who was asking like why do I have to do the CKA before the CKS if I just if I'm a CISO or I'm a security stakeholder only why do I need to know how to administrate a Kubernetes cluster? It's a fair question, right? Yeah, and uh, I thought that one of the one of the good reasons, obviously, was you need to know the impact when you're implementing security policies onto your developers and your admins, right? It's not just enough that you come in with security expertise and you just build it into, you know, upstream at the very end, basically saying, hey, you can't use this image. Okay, well, you know, what's the effect downstream and, and all the way into the cluster? So, yeah, I, I really thought that getting hands-on in the cluster first with the CKA and then actually, you know, starting to get more examples outside the cluster onto the individual nodes when you're building a node, you know, shifting it left, so to speak, for, for your buzzword. Um, yeah, I, I really thought they did a good job with that. And I, mentally, it just makes sense, for, for me at least. Mentally. I, I think it's interesting because um, I didn't want to say this at the, at the time. He's probably watching this show now, and I'm going to say it, and he's going to wonder about it. But there was just this um, 
almost a tendency amongst security professionals to think they don't need to know how the DevOps team operate. They just need to secure it. And actually, that's maybe an older school of thinking, really, if we're thinking about the mythical uh, unicorn poo that is DevSecOps. We they we really do need to unite in our thinking, and I think the fact that CKS forces you down the CKA route is great. And if anything, I thought a lot of the advice you gave on the we on the webinar or meetup was valid for the CKA. So just the way you approach the exam, because it's as much learning the format as it is knowing the content. Oh yeah, and I I think that the Linux Foundation, the fact that they give you a free retake, uh, I think that's a must. I think you know you get in there get hands on, you might know all the topics and just get too flustered. So here's a free retake, come back and come back a little stronger. So yeah, no, I, I thought it was a great conversation. I was happy that we actually had such a great turnout for the first meetup. Um, and yeah, I'm doing a, another big talk. So I'll talk for an hour at this for the CNCF next week too, if you if you guys are still interested in the, in the CKS. Yeah, that's cool. Is there a way we could put a link to that somehow in our notes in case somebody's wanting and wants to know where that yeah, is? Yeah, I can. I, I will find that CNCF link uh, in two seconds, and I'll post it down in the chat, and I'll also drop it in the YouTube video that we that we post at the end. Alrighty, awesome. Shall we move on to the next segment of the show? Let's do it. All right. Oh. Yes. First stupid headline. <laughs> First stupid headline. Ah. Do you want to do the WhatsApp? Yeah, let's go WhatsApp first. It's there's some we have a bunch of, of really good headlines. Uh, WhatsApp updates their privacy policy and the internet lights up. Uh, it yes, is it is it real? Uh, didn't they very shortly afterwards say uh, oh that was the clarification that we were highlighting that they said we're not they almost like trying to claw back some of the uh, customer yeah. loss, let's say usage loss. Yeah, um, I I mean, for what I scoured the internet for in terms of their policy updates, you know, in terms of, they're just not necessarily the old school peer-to-peer -peer chat that they were originally when it first came out, obviously exactly. bought by Facebook, and I think somewhat guilty by proxy in a lot of people's minds, right? With Facebook's lack of uh, data privacy. Let's say, yeah, so, <laughs> famous uh, lack. Yeah, so like when you have an alternative, you know, like Signal that comes in and then gets basically pumped by like people like Elon Musk, everybody just goes, "Whoa, all right." Well, you know, they start they start leaving. So it's it's one of those things. I think there's always going to be a market for uh, a company that does you know peer to peer encryption uh, and peer to peer messaging, you know. Now, now Signal is basically WhatsApp, what, from like four or five years ago. So. Well, the, so the headline I think I saw today was that, is Signal the Zoom of 2021? Uh, ah, pred prediction. I don't know. That seems a bit. I don't want to make a prediction on that one. Well, <laughs> that's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I just, it, like with all these applications, there is some way that somebody is making money, right? So if it's not data, you know, it's, there has to be some sort of advertising in the actual application itself. Somebody's making money somewhere. So I really question if, if somebody comes out with signal that's peer to peer, how are they sustaining themselves? You know, that's funny. That's, you know, that's in the world we question. live in. It is. Yeah. It's the usual if if you're not paying for it, you're the product. Uh, yeah. Speaking mantra, of paying too much. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of paying too much, Uber defrauded out of a hundred million. Uh, let me I have this, I have these lined up. So I'm gonna do, do this. Up? Yeah, okay, yeah, so dude, check it out. Uber burned through, I mean, <laughs> Uber's just burning <laughs> cash. But yeah, Uber wastes 100 million on useless digital ad campaigns. And I love, wow, that's a hell of a first uh, sentence right there. Uber sucks on so many levels. Uh, <laughs> I didn't write this, I did not write this, but uh, no. yeah, it's uh, basically they realized that a bunch of their advertising campaigns didn't actually amount to any increased revenue or click throughs or anything like that. And some of, some of it was other apps that were defrauding Uber saying that they were generating click-throughs when they weren't, so. Yes. So don't be an Uber uh, in many ways, but there are there are tools. If you're doing a, a campaign like this, look around. There are tools to detect the uh, malicious clicks that cost you money. So that's a security thing. Go check it out. I think we, we, uh, we can advise that 
It's a very short article. Funny though. Yeah. Alrighty. Next, next up, a popular topic. Uh, we we haven't even have we mentioned uh, the B word yet? Mm. On we only had one show, so yeah, we're we're breaking the rules. On our second. Uh, so, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's always funny. I think back and so I, my my personal podcast started in when when did Bitcoin first not first last go big twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. I, I want to say 17. 17. I, say I think 17. it was 17. Because I think uh, when I first started doing my own podcast, my first podcast was What is Bitcoin? And it was a response to my family asking me, because it's in the media so often, what is it? And there were loads of, like the story about how the first guy who spent 10,000 Bitcoin on two pizzas or something like that. Oh it was like a $24 billion pizza or something like that. Uh, but yeah, this is the... Let's see, the most recent uh, idiot story uh, regarding Bitcoin. Thankfully, it's not me because I have I have a whole half Bitcoin. Losing 220 million in Bitcoin. I, this, If anything I like about when Bitcoin goes up in value is all the Bitcoin tragedy stories. Oh, is, that, yeah. is that wrong? <laughs> I, I mean, I think they should publish more because I remember in 2017 reading stories about people taking, you know, mortgages out against their house and stuff like that, trying to ride the, the hype train, so to speak. It's like, man, I feel I feel almost sad for uh, for people that are willing to gamble on Bitcoin. But I this was one I, I think when I was reading it, he wrote the password down. It was a generated password, wrote it on a piece of paper in like 2012 and has lost it. And he has 10 guesses, basically. Oh yeah, two. yeah. He has two left. I two, read he has two left. Yeah, he has two left. <laughs> Which is funny, right? Which means because he thinks he knows it. <laughs> like if he had no idea, like if it was mm -hmm. like if it was like a last pass or one password generated gobbledygook, you wouldn't even try. Yeah, you'd be like, bah. But it isn't. It's password with an ass with an at sign, or it's wait, was it password one? Like he's doing. He's doing one of those where he's getting close. He thinks he can remember. If he can hack his own password, basically. If he can remember his own <laughs> password, he's like, well, I'm pretty sure I put a capital P on it. Yeah. Oh, sad. Which Anyways, is, I, I hope he hits the lottery and gets it on like the 10th try. That would honestly be the best feeling in the world. So like that would be, that would be, that would be, I think he could probably, if anything, I think he can make some money by uh, televising his final attempt. Yeah. You know, that would be the kind of Geraldo Rivera sort of uh, hosted episode that at least he'd get like, you know, a couple thousand pounds mm -hmm. or something to try and make that happen. Uh, so, All right. You added one. You added yeah, one that I hadn't I read this, yet. Yeah. I found this really interesting and I wanted to share with, with everybody. But um, is this the so Wi Fi I, one? Yeah. So some academics turned. RAM into Wi-Fi to use in air gap environments. So academics from an Israeli university uh, can send stolen data up, up to about 100 bits per second. And basically what they did was everything that sends electric current has sends off electromagnetic waves. They set the read writes into the memory to hit, uh, I think it's like 2400 gigahertz, which is just about in the range of Wi-Fi. And that wave, if they hold it up to the Wi-Fi of another computer, will be picked up, and they were able to access the computer in, a, in an air-gapped environment. So, very interesting. They actually have a whole list on this on this web page. I'll post in the chat. They have a whole list of of other projects that they've done to to get into other air-gapped environments. So, this is oh, it's sneaky stuff. It's extremely really cool. And I'm, I haven't read it yet because we only just added it. It was, this was our, this is why I decided, I thought, I think I pinged you just before this. We need a breaking news. We need like a do, do, do kind of, <laughs> we catch stuff at the last minute that has to go in because it's timely and it's fascinating. Cause this is today at 2 PM my time. This is only like mm -hmm. three hours ago. Very awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. There's some, yeah. Back. There's some some other ways to counteract this that that uh, was talked about in the in the article. So if you are in an air gapped environment, I'm sure the government is looking at these things very very closely. I thought it was uh, interesting. And yeah, sorry for dropping that one on you. 
No, it was cool. I mean, I, I don't mind. It, it's <laughs> these things happen. There are, there's news on Friday and we don't want to wait until the, uh, until the end. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's the end of WTF. Is it not? Yeah. That was all the crazy mm-hmm. stuff that, that I have for you okay. today. All right. So we're going to, you've got one article in the yeah, so STF. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the STF category, the stuff to follow. FTC is doing data tracking. They have the the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. has gone and basically gone after. I think it was like, is Amazon, TikTok, uh, TikTok, 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 uh, Snap, Twitter, YouTube, basically every everybody that's publicly traded, and they want to figure out how data is collected at each company. They have I think sixty days to respond to. So I think it's something that we're going to follow to see what the FTC is going to do with this data. If there's going to be any legislation crafted, I. Th- it's going to be interesting to see, especially after you know you watch Europe, like the EU and their data protection laws, if, if the U.S. follows a similar uh, sort of style. So something worth following. Totally. Watch, Very cool. Watch Big Tech in 2021 as they hopefully move to have more data restrictions, in my opinion. Uh, they never give us anything. Uh, they never. There's never any shortage from Big Tech uh, in terms of security discussions and data privacy, is there? No, um, <laughs> there's all right. A, a data, data runs the world. There's always a bunch of information that can be pulled, gleaned, profiled from you. So <laughs> somebody's got to make money yeah. somewhere. Somebody does have to make money somewhere. Alrighty, that is. So shall we move straight on to tool time? Let's do it. All right. Yeah, for tool time, Steve, you have a great. Well, and we talked about it at last episode, Pixie Labs. Yeah, and um, showcase a demo. So. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a couple things. I'm gonna put it in context. And so the first thing I wanted to bring up was just, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the the article from the chief, which was the top five Kubernetes dashboards, because that takes me into, because Pixie Labs is essentially a SaaS Kubernetes dashboard for observability, right? Uh, it was interesting that it didn't make this list. Ah. Uh-huh. Uh, for for historical discussion, Pixie Labs was launched, I believe, last year. Um, they had a big whopper of a announcement in October, of which some figureheads of the industry, like Kelsey Hightower, were there giving speeches saying how awesome it was, which immediately gave it value. And then they were bought by New Relic mm-hmm. for re- relatively quickly. Like if you'd held on, you think it would have been worth more, but nine point something million, let's say rounded up to 10 million. So it was very much a create something, bake it up, and get the heck out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of strange startup scenario, right? That doesn't that's not something you see too often. Um, but putting it into context, though, it is a dashboard. What other dashboards are available? I thought this was an interesting article that came out in the chief and advertisement, advertisement. The, number one, number one, Foster, the, the, the Kubernetes, Kubernetes dashboard. Yes, the default dashboard that uh, I believe was the reason for the Tesla hack a couple years ago. Yep, still number one. <laughs> still number one. Uh, not the dashboard's fault, but just people deploying the dashboard as default and leaving that endpoint open to the public. So yes, um, watch out and for I'm that. Gonna, I'm going to talk about that in two seconds, uh, but I, another flavor, another flavor of it. Octant, which I like to talk about because I like Octant um, as a dashboard. I like Octant because you can write your own bits and plug your own data in. So if you've got like a a data gathering plugin for Kubernetes, or you've got a CRD that has information, you can make something that plugs into Octant and you can visualize anything through Octant. Super extendable, like Octant. Weavescope. Weavescope's, I don't know anybody who uses Weavescope, do you? I, I don't know anybody personally, no. Okay, well, we'll find some in a moment. So, <laughs> we've got wait, we've worked. It's pretty cool, but it's got a sexy visual. So, if you like sexy visuals, yes, we've scope has got it nailed. I mean, if you're doing demos, it, it helps a lot. Like Kubernetes on the command line isn't really uh, isn't really hot. So, you know, throw a well, nice dashboard in there, and you're good to go. Yeah, absolutely. Do you even? I don't know Constellate. Do you? No, I've never worked with with Constellate. Although it's got a pretty good following on GitHub, it looks like. Yeah. 
Um, I do, I do like kind of that, like the network sort of look to uh, managing Kubernetes resources. I find, especially for a lot of beginners, like the dashboard's cool because you know you can kind of see the general metrics and how many deployments you have, right? But when you get into you know things like um, like if you're using Istio and, and stuff like that, and uh, Kiali for like the net the the network graph and things like that, I think that that really helps people kind of put together all the microservices in their head. So, all right, big fan of that view. Okay, nice. I like I like I like image. I, I like visuals. The, <laughs> going straight, moving straight on into visuals. Uh, Kubops view cov. Uh, essentially, if you love nineteen eighty ish video games. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. This, this is pretty cool. This is for you. More more of a beginner fun thing, I think, than um, you would ever use it at a company. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> it's. I, uh, I don't think I would assemble the C-suite uh, into an emergency board meeting to demonstrate this. Yeah. So, so off the back cool. of this. It's pretty cool looking, yeah. And it was it was funny enough looking that it not, now makes me want to go play with it. So I'm probably going to do that. Maybe we'll do a demo of that. So this one reminded me of Pixie Labs because if I and I'm going to move on to that, but not before I address the issue uh, that you brought up about how the Kubernetes dashboard was left exposed. That mm -hmm. has not stopped happening. So, and my current example I'm going to talk about is WeScope. Uh, and for, for those who are, uh, and I think probably we probably have an audience that spans both dev ops and security, I would hope. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully dev ops looking to learn about security. So my typical play thing is Shodan, you know Shodan, Shodan's loads of fun because baddies know Shodan. They're typically using the Shodan command line. There's lots of good, um, attack vectors or scenarios that for container containerization where they use Shodan to hop. There was one called Graboid that happened last year, which was a worm that used the Shodan API to hop to look for more vulnerable locations to hop to. And it used a, let's see if this works, a search or an API based search that was a bit like, yay. And this is the problem with, with live demos. This is probably gonna backfire in my face. Uh, it was looking for, oh, I wouldn't put Docker. It was looking for open Docker API ports. Let's see if it works. There we go, better. I didn't need container. But the idea that port 2375 is open for a Docker is bad. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> you don't say. So always good fun to search Shodan to see what's going on. Lots of ways to abuse it. Don't. But that's just one example. I'll, and I'll give you one other fun, super fun example uh, for Kubernetes fans. If I just look for the word at CD, uh, I'm not even gonna look for, look for the port. And I'm gonna, oh, look, Amazon, America. If, if I click through there, huh, looky, look at that port. So, Let's not dive any further into that because if I were to do uh, API v2 keys, I could probably hoover all the keys out of that and that would be a bad thing to do live. But generally, expose that CD, don't do it on your Kubernetes, just throwing that out there. So really, really easy. The last one I wanted to show you, of course, uh, in terms of exposed dashboards, uh, was good old fashioned, good old weave scope we just saw. So there's searches for that too. Only 42, not too bad. But this one again in the States and the port for WeScope is 4040. Thankfully not there. I'm not gonna dive into this, but if you can get in here and you can find a 4040 like that, probably able to find a visual of WeScope with some pretty pictures. The problem with WeScope uh -huh. is that if you click on a pod, you can, depending on how you configured it, there's a command line and you go, boop, and now I have a command line inside the pod. You can do it with the UI. What? Wow. So of these, many of these will be vulnerable. So there you go. This is why you don't leave your dashboards facing the outside world. Oh. Moving on, dashboards. <laughs> the good yeah, thing about having us. a good thing about <laughs> the good thing about having a SaaS solution dashboard is all the security that actually comes with it. Hey, not too bad, right? 
this is Pixie Labs. They're just default homepage. Instantly troubleshoot your applications on Kubernetes. No instrumentation. That's not entirely true, but debugging with scripts all inside Kubernetes. And you just run this script to install, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, and if you go to docs, it continues down that path. You just say bash this. And if you're wondering what happens, this is what happens. It runs Pixie. You see this, I did it. Blah, 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 blah. Ask a few questions, does a few things. Ding dong, you've got it running. And this is my, this is not, this is the other environment, but this is the environment that I had running. And then you just run PX deploy. So th this is probably a bit crowded now, but let me clear that up. I hope I can spell clear. Then you just run a PX deploy. I'm not going to do that because it'll reinstall it. But it's pretty straightforward in terms of what you can do and what you can run. Uh, the deployment, the installation took five minutes. The It authenticated through creating an account. I logged in through my Gmail in order to access my G Cloud. That mm -hmm. is where my GKE is. And from there, just typing deploy, it figured everything out. It took about uh, 50, it's longer than I could do live on the demo, which is why I'm not doing it now, but about <laughs> 10, 15 minutes. Well, really, I was, I was tempted to do the full install, and I thought, no, that's no one's going to have the patience um, to do that. So I thought, I'll install, and then I'll just, even this is a bit slow, then I will pop up to the top what it installed so you can see everything in the Pixie Labs namespace. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily know the, the anatomy of it, so it would be interesting maybe to get a guest, somebody from Pixie Labs up here to, to talk mm -hmm. us through how it's constructed. But the thing that took time was these Vizier PEMs because they communicate back to the SaaS solution. It does all the security for you. You don't have to do anything. It establishes all the certs and boom, boom, boom. You are, you are done, which from a user experience perspective rocked. And what I was left with, oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? No, I, You're I, I yeah, I know it's crazy. The, uh, <laughs> so this all ships, the ships data to an external service, right? It's a SaaS solution. You got it. So, so it's shipping it then, to here. Yeah. And you got uh, multiple clusters as well, right? All shipping to one dashboard. There you go. So this is when it shipped me back, when it was done, it actually just tells you go to work with pick work dot work with pixie dot AI. So it gives you a little thing at the bottom saying, all right, now go here. So you can mm -hmm. click it from the command line. You can just go straight there. You log in with the same credentials that gave you that bash command. And this shows up. And you're like, oh, OK. And I already I did multiple clusters once, but your clusters are interchangeable here. So I've got Stigi's play area. Hey, look, it's back. And then you've got SG Pixie, my latest one that I did today. Let's see if this works. Uh, so now we'll do the warts and all version of it. I did find that occasionally it doesn't communicate. Um, I'm going to go back to Pixie because it's a little simpler. Because uh, I have eight nodes in one and only two mm -hmm. in here. So this is at a glance. First thing you'll see is like things that communicate to one another. So this is just the Pixie Labs Kelvin service itself. This is just Pixie Labs communicating to itself. If it's not doing anything, you don't see it, which is interesting. Because the only thing active is Pixie Labs right now, so it looks yeah, like I don't you have. Can't, you can't like enable to view all of your your uh, pods or containers. Well, I, I'm right. starting to think. So let let's let me check something. Right, live. This is where this is where things go bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was kind of curious because you see it. You normally think when you see those service graphs, you can kind of narrow it down to like by namespace, whole cluster. You know, maybe sort by labels. Right. Mm. So let's kill that. This is the WeSox, which is running there. And I just wanted to see if I refreshed, does it show me some of the WeSox? Ah, there you go. Okay. So it's there now because it was alive. Not, because you just, yeah. Interesting. Gotcha. Which I <laughs> kind of like. I did find it odd that when I tried to move things, you see it tried to move the whole widget. I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. Uh, hover over. No, that didn't do anything. And then I, I started double clicking on stuff, and eventually it started to move. And I swear, Foster, you saw it. You saw it move, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm to, for you. Yeah. Did you double click it before? 
I don't know what I did. Oh, there, I double clicked. Yeah. Ah, uh, double click seems to activate user experience issues. That was, mm -hmm. it's not quite that obvious when yeah, to move the, it or the prettiest dashboard, like formatting and spacing, I think, in, in terms of all that, but. Yeah, we noticed a few mm -hmm. hiccups like enable hierarchy. Neat, it's a hierarchy, except now I can't see anything and I can't move it. <laughs> so I disabled the hierarchy and now it's back into a new position that I can't see and can't move. So I ended up having to do this and refresh and get back to what I was wanting to look at. So very cool, very cool, like, cause it's all there, but it, they, how long have they been around? Not that long, right? Yeah. I think what's straight up cool about it though, is it gives you CPU usage, pod count, just tons of performance stats, latency on the network communication. It breaks everything down in terms of like from an ops perspective, it's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And if you just want to geek out, you can even open this up and you can see what was the, the JSON sort of response to this query that populated this data. Yeah, are there any admin controls directly from this dashboard? I'm kind of just kind of curious because it is a SaaS solution, and you think like now you're outside the cluster. Are you giving you know Pixie Labs a new Relic the ability to change things in the cluster, or is every, is this just more observability? It's just observability, as far as I can yeah. see. Uh, mm -hmm. The only thing I I noticed is that I don't see a way like to create users. It's not at a level of a SaaS solution where. I can have global visibility, but I can give people who work for me limited visibility. It's like, mm -hmm. if it's here, it's here, you know? Yeah. So you'd have to have multiple logins uh, to Pixie Labs and then have multiple clusters pointing into unique um, tenants. Uh, the solution, so this is, uh, sorry, just in the chat, this is Pixie Labs. This was a startup that recently got bought by New Relic. You can right. install this. They have um, it's it's not like a free trial. Like you can go and install it, and I'm guessing like once you get to a certain amount or a certain amount of time, maybe you have to start paying for it. I have no idea. I just I did it, and it, yeah, and it's working. So yeah, they do have a free like, offering, though. At least you can go and test it out. Yeah, exactly. And it's it is its biggest win is its documentation is really good. Mm -hmm. Quick. It's install is quick and easy. It's a bash and adding it to your cluster is one line. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be, it worked flawlessly for me. The only trouble I got into was once I had all this great observability, it would just conk out and not talk to my cluster for a bit. Some of those Vizier pods just crashed and rebooted a few times. Uh, it was a little light and, but the data it's got is super cool. And if I don't like GUIs, any of these scripts, which is kind of what requests the data, I get the feeling you can write your own, but also if you want to get any data extracted, you can use the command line to make that mm -hmm. to make that same thing happen, like pxpod. Uh, I can play with a bit of fire again here and say px run px slash pod. See if it'll actually produce some data. Uh, it did work, there we go. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. You you get the same information back if it's available. Of course, mm -hmm. it looks like a very empty table uh, and a link to go view it live if you want in your environment. So interesting. So good, yeah. but sometimes a little flaky. I probably should have run namespaces so I could compare it to that one, which I could, I could, I probably do very quickly so that we can say, look, we have the same data. Yeah. There we go. So you got the it's same table on the command line. Yeah, definitely an interesting tool. I I don't know enough about it, but I am s always skeptical. Like when things are normally very easy, I wonder how much permission is getting granted to uh, certain yeah. applications, right? Like you're running a batch script, and then maybe if I go and look at where the script is and all the files on GitHub and stuff like that, I'm like, oh yeah, they have complete qubit min access in the cluster. And all that data is getting exported to a SaaS service. So from a security standpoint, I can kind of okay. need to know more. But from a beginner standpoint, getting up and running, you're going to go throw it in your kind cluster and you're running, you know, stock shop. Yeah, I think it's great. Try it out. Um, Problem with yeah. throwing in your kind cluster, it's a SaaS solution. So you'd be allowing a SaaS to reach in. <laughs> Probably not yeah, a good idea. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, keep it I'm, on GK. <laughs> keep it on, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. But a nice start. Uh, worth 10 million? I don't know. 
It's interesting to see speaking. how they're going to integrate it into uh, like their APM, like their performance monitoring and stuff like that, right? With New Relic. So yeah, um, yeah I could definitely very... see the the functionality of of this dashboard picking up and 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 morphing pretty quickly in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's going to be it. We're going to in two years' time if they really build this out with more engineering, we're going to have a conversation on this show going. Remember how bad it used to be? <laughs> now it's awesome. Yeah, because honestly, I I actually really like New Relic as a service. I think their their dashboards are like pretty slim, sleek, easy to use. So I think it'd be cool. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a SaaS solution, but then I am actually a big fan too of of solutions that can be deployed just on prem in private clusters away from from the uh, from external data getting siphoned out. So I, I I don't know. I don't want to speak for the CEO, but I hope they do that. Okay, bring the awesome. board, get it, and and make it uh, put it on prem. Sweet. Okay, uh, I think that's it. That was the super fast version of uh tour of pixie labs because we're already over by six minutes we try and keep this to 30 minutes and we've already failed how about that second episode in <laughs> we'll be all right yeah actually that means well we just we had a bunch of other content but we'll just shift it over to to next week next friday 1 p.m eastern 6 p.m central what do you technically gmt uh it's uh for it's 6 p.m for me yeah but what's the for you. what's it called? GMT? GMT, right? Well, say GMT, yeah. Yeah. UK time. People know what you mean when you say UK time. Uh oh, one yeah. preview I'd like to do for so it'll be a combination tool time. Uh and Foster, we haven't agreed this, but I'm saying it. Uh we roughly did. So we've been talking about solar winds uh, a lot because it's still in the press, still in the news. CrowdStrike re uh released a really good blog article from one of their hyper brains mm -hmm. that talks about kind of how it was executed and there's a great way of showing you an open source security tool that could have i think prevented the solar winds hack and that would be really interesting as a sort of a hands-on like this to show you next week sounds good we got we got no more tool time next week and the week after that i have some some ideas as well so yeah, stay tuned. We look forward to to bring you more content, more crazy stuff, and more cool demos. Let us know if you want us to you know, pick apart some other open source tool. We'd be happy to to showcase and and take a look in, into things for you. Yeah, do we have a banner that says, "Oh, my banner has been changed. I have to change the." We used to have one that said, "Write us at community at uh, stackrocks .com. Is that where it lives? Yeah, stackrocks at community.com. I mean, you can also just ping me on Twitter, ping me on CNCF Slack. You know, we're everywhere. It's probably uh, worth saying. Our Twitter, our Twitters are on the screen. Mm -hmm. oh, we're we're the chat. What the heck is this? What's going on with Bitcoin? This is crazy. There it is. I said we said Bitcoin way too much in this episode. We, okay, we won't talk about Bitcoin for another month. Promise. All right. I'm just gonna say the B word, but there's the email address. We both respond to this email address. So if you have any ideas, you think I saw this, this is amazing, do it. Or you don't want to try out an awesome new Kubernetes security tool, you want us to be the guinea pigs, we would do it with, with pleasure. All right, so we end the show. Let's do it. We'll see you next week. Right. See Take you next care, week. Bye.